the body has so much information about whatever the subject may be. The body is your mind. And so we use that vehicle to have an experience that can be very profound, that can move you through obstacles. We're all coming from certain limitations that could be based in trauma in our childhood or experiences we may have had. So our body has an instinct to cope and therefore armor itself. And so it can limit our ability to express ourselves, ergo, our ability to even know ourselves. Because I put expression and knowing very closely together. This episode may inspire you to give the practice of walking in your shoes a go on your own. We waive all responsibility for any ensuing mishaps of cramped spaces, being near stairs, or inspired bouts of wild and or naked abandon. On a more serious note, we do discuss heavy subjects like trauma, armoring, drowning, rape, and PTSD. But predominantly, we delve into the healing power and intelligence of the body invited into highly conscious motion and given free reign and guidance to express all that it knows. Hey folks, welcome to the Brilliant Body Podcast, a forum to learn about and liberate the brilliance of your body and ultimately to expand the meaning and experience of intelligence. Join me, Ali Mize, and other body masters to explore pioneering and varied perspectives on what it means and feels like to be embodied. So many people feel disconnected from their bodies due to emotional or physical pain or even conditioning and lack of education. Others feel quite at home in their bodies yet want to learn to have more pleasure, awareness, and access to the body's guidance. This podcast is for everybody. Each one of my trailblazing guests has studied their own bodies and others' bodies for decades and will share their expertise and unique mission, how to thrive as a body. So join us and reclaim your body's brilliance. My guest, Joseph Culp, is an actor, director, and filmmaker, working in theater, film, and television for over 40 years. He's known to many audiences for playing Don Draper's father in the hit series Mad Men, and is the first Doctor Doom in Marvel's The Fantastic Four. In addition to producing several independent films, he notably wrote, directed, and co-starred in Welcome to the Men's Group, a comedy drama about a men's support group. In addition to his work as a performing artist, Joseph's been involved for many years in the world of somatic psychology and personal development. Joseph co-founded the Walking in Your Shoes Body-Mind Process with psychologist John F. Cogswell, PhD, during the late 1980s. The method known as walking combines somatic empathy with movement, mindfulness, and the facilitated inquiry processing of the body-mind. Joseph formed the Los Angeles-based Walking Theater Group in 1992 to explore the use of the WIYS method in dramatic arts. He founded the WIYS Institute of America and regularly gives workshops, seminars, and trainings in both the U.S. and Europe. What I love about this work so much is that it reminded me how brilliant our bodies really are, that it's mm -hmm. not just feeling it as a sensational sensory instrument that may or may not guide us a bit, but it gives full on images, memories, emotions, spiritual insights in a way that is so body-based that there's no way that it's not the body one way or another. It's releasing <laughs> these things to us in a way to have cognitive connection that we might not have otherwise. It's inextricably related and expressive of all the material, all our memory, all our lineage our ancestry, our personal experience, our collective experience, thus the name of this podcast, The Brilliant Body, because it is all there if we just access it. And walking in your shoes is one of those beautiful methods that allows us, that teaches us and gives us the method by which we can access fluently all that information. I'm so excited to have Joseph Culp as my guest today. Hello. Hi there. Hello. Nice to see you. 
Nice to see you too. All righty, let's go for this. I first want to mention how you and I met about 12 years ago. I found out about walking in your shoes in a constellation training that I was in the midst of, and it was featured as one of the techniques. It's a sister technique to constellation work and was developed concurrently, which I always find absolutely fascinating that over in Germany, family constellation work was getting underway. And your little band of actors were sitting in and walking yeah. around and adventuring in a small room together with Dr. Cogswell. So I want to speak more about that and how that actually happened. But then I ended up in this little room in the Electric Lodge in Venice and absolutely fell in love with this work. It's an amazing technique, which you're going to explain far more mm. than a technique, actually, that opens such doorways into our connectedness to ourselves and each other. From there, it was clear to me that this was something that really needed to get out into the world as far and wide as possible. Mm. So that's how you and I met. I don't know mm. if you want to add anything to that before we loop mm. back around to how this all started. I just think you have that that wonderful gift of being a motivator and visionary who says more people should know about this. <laughs> we got to get that out. I think that's part of your gift. It's um, a compulsion for sure. <laughs> and a compulsion. Absolutely. Uh, how is this going to change the world? And indeed, we did, at least through the people who began to become exposed more to it. I was always training people in quotes by the experiential, by being in my workshops, but not in a formalized way. You not only can learn this, but you can work with others. And that's important because the nature of what is the facilitator, maybe we'll talk about that, is so important to the process. And you can do it as a profession or as an adjunct to the profession you're already doing with coaching, exactly. with therapy, with addiction work, with Good work, you know, business yeah. work, name it. You can bring it into anything you already do, or you can make it its own singular offering. They've either added it to what they do, or they've said, no, now I'm going to be a walking facilitator and offer this to clients far and wide. And it was those early sessions in California where we had our kind of starter group that you helped put together. I really took a cue from that and began to say, okay, this should happen more often whenever I can manage it. And it even prompted me to develop a training. And now there's like a training manual and there's modules that are very developed. And I even do it online now, small beginnings and the legacy goes on. So I want to thank you for that and prompting the impulse and the compulse. There's two elements. <laughs> so we better explain what this is. What is walking in your shoes? So my best definition often keeps modifying, but basically walking in your shoes is a body-mind process. Some say method, some say technique. I call it process because process orients us to the notion that there is something working or moving within it. And that's a big part of it. So the process of walking in your shoes is a combination of setting an intention through empathy. So we say an empathic intention that puts forward something that you would like to know or I would say no underlined and in parentheses to experience because we say knowing is experiencing. It's not knowing something in the mind mentally. Mm -hmm. It's knowing through experience, which means the body mind experience. It means this new verb that everyone likes to use now called to presence something. Presencing was never a verb before as far as I know, but it is now. And what does that even mean, to presence something? I think it means not just to know or encounter, but to engage on a body-mind level, sensorily, emotionally, possibly, energetically, to presence something, to bring it into the now through the body. And so what we do in walking is a combination of intention, empathy, and the big ingredient, movement. 
Yeah. Uh, movement is the mainstay of walking in your shoes. It is, in fact, why we even call it walking, because we actually use the very, very simple mode of movement walking. Walking is the simplest thing you can ever do. It's automatic. You don't have to think about it. And what that does, it puts the body mind in motion and in movement. We can talk about why movement is important, but it offers many things. The most basic is that it will increase your awareness very quickly. Rather than sitting in a chair and knowing something, you will know through movement. The thing about it too is, as you were saying, when you're actually experiencing it in a physical way, whatever you come to know or learn is immediately integrated, which often doesn't happen with cognitive learning. You can forget whatever happens within seconds for some of us. Uh, <laughs> Where, boy, once oh boy. you experience <laughs> it in the body, it becomes a part of you. I love that. And um, absolutely, I would say this is part of the, not only the benefit, but one of the great guiding motivations of why do a walk about something. It is because you will directly experience something that you can integrate. Whereas I can sit and say, I know I have a oneness with the universe or whatever, but I'll probably forget it pretty quickly. <laughs> but if I have a consciously felt experience of it, that has a way of lasting or bringing you back much more quickly to that insight. So if you combine intention, empathic intention, and we say empathic intention, okay, what is empathy? We have to go into that a bit. Let's just say to feel with something is the empathic experience. To feel about something might be sympathetic, or there's a certain amount of detachment. But empathy, we like to say, is a gift that belongs to everyone. It has varying degrees, how much I allow myself to empathize with others or life itself or myself for that matter, but it is a gift. And so we use that gift with the walking through the intention, go into movement. Movement then becomes consciously felt. Therefore, we are combining the third piece, which is mindfulness. Mindfulness being in full consciousness of what is happening as it's happening. And this is very key with all the studies that finally have been done about meditation and or yoga or the benefits to the body-mind of mindfulness. That is very different to have an action or an experience not being processed in the moment, felt in the moment, consciously aware in the moment. It doesn't last, as you said, or it just becomes a memory. This is very different. We add mindfulness to what is happening in my movement through this intention. And the fourth part of the walking experience, I would call the somatic inquiry process, which is usually working with a facilitator who facilitates your own self-inquiry into what is happening for you. And this combination of a facilitator walker experience, co-create a very fully felt experience. And there are many benefits to that. There is a safe experience because you have a partner essentially in your walk who's there reflecting and supporting you. And helping and, you verbalize what you're experiencing in your body. So I find that it really helps bridge that gap, the corpus callosum yeah. seems to be firing much more easily when there's someone there able to help the right and the left. Absolutely. Link. Go try walking around your room and just noting what's happening to you by yourself. <laughs> you can do it, but you'll probably end up in the kitchen making a sandwich or something. You're like, oh, I thought I was walking my intention of self-love, but actually <laughs> <I'm> just eating <laughs> and... When you have a facilitator who's tracking you, who's with you, who's holding a container for you and mirroring the experience through language, through emotional content, resonance, if you will, that's a very different experience. That's an opportunity to go deep into what's this all for? What would you do this little process for? Anything, anything you would like to know or clarify. I often say, what would you like to clarify? 
Mm. We have many blind spots in life. We have many things that are tugging at us that need attention, but we don't know quite how to access the information. You might want to empower something in your life that is nascent and wants to unfold, but there may be attendant issues, obstacles, fears about that thing that wants to unfold. The walking process is an invitation to allow that to come forward. And it comes forward at least three-dimensionally, if not more dimensionally, through your body-mind. And when I say body mind, I mean the body, but a body is your mind. And so we use that vehicle to have an experience that can be very profound, that can move you through obstacles that you're not quite able to verbalize or even understand because they're at a level of bodily experience that just simply because of our complex human nature can be very difficult to associate. In fact, we're often very dissociated. And walking in your shoes process has a way of, as you said it at the beginning, of a shortcutting that dissociation and getting right to the heart of the matter, right into the heart of your body and your psyche. I don't think I did say that yet, but I'm glad you just did. Mm -hmm. Because many of us view the body as being this subconscious and the unconscious, that it is somehow this fleshy matrix of all that we are, all that we have been, and the gateway to all we will be. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. what I find particularly helpful and revelatory about this practice is it reminds us what we by nature, by birthright even, have within ourselves, that we have this capacity, if we hadn't been trained out of knowing through our bodies and as our bodies, we would naturally know, okay, do I want to buy that house or that house? Is this person good for me or not? Why am I afraid of something? Any we kind would. of query that we have. Mm -hmm. And some people naturally do know how to just feel their body and what they call gut instinct or intuition. But this makes it fluent and accessible in a way that doesn't require sitting cross-legged for years, meditating to practice spiritual gifts to access mm -hmm. them. This is, again, our birthright, our flesh and our being. It's and walking in your shoes gives us, as you say, direct access to that at any time. It is an infinitely practical method of knowing at a level that will bring you, I would say, just increased awareness will not simply be a thought thinking mentalized process. And when we do that, when we allow this practical gift that we seem to have, people say tuning into the wisdom of the body. We, we love that phrase. We know it has truth. We know there is wisdom. There's a gut feeling or a feeling in my bones or intuition. Walking for me just gives you that direct access. And I would say it's a heightened experience in that you're working with the facilitator, sometimes a group also in a group setting, which brings a heightened or profound experience. And that is something somewhat missing from our daily encounter with the world. And so I also want to piggyback on what you're saying that not only is it something that everyone, and I believe this, has the ability to do to greater or lesser degrees. I do not believe it is a specialized psychic gift. It is something that just needs a kind of combined model in order to access the things that everyone actually has access to. But we need a model that works for that. And somehow combining this intention, movement, the fact of our empathy, or the gift of it, I like to say, and the inquiry process will bring you there. Interesting that, you call it a model and not a method. I mean, I know you call it a method as well, but I'm curious about that use of the word model. Yeah, when I use that word, I mean the how-to, which is how do you do that? Meditation has a model. Yoga has a structure of a certain kind. And I think that the walking process has one. It's fairly open-ended, 
in a way, but it has features. It has a facilitator spine, if you will, that wants to invite you to look at various parts of the experience. There is a kind of a, a flow of inquiry. When I was first discovering walk and practicing it with actors and psychologists, over and over, it started to emerge that there was a kind of model, a kind of structure that we could say, that's a walk. That's how we could conceive of it. And I find that important because people can often say, oh, so you just say whatever you want to be and you walk around and that's it. And I say, well, in a sense, yes. And in a sense, it, it, there's a lot more that can be drawn from that experience. And the model of a walk, which again is fluid in many ways, but it can require study. It can require a lot of practice to have faith in it, if you will, or trust it. I mean, faith in the form of trust, not belief. And like everything, it requires practice, but you can do one right now. You can do a walk and you will have an experience. When you said it was the sister of Constellation, which uh, is fascinating that during the early 80s to late 80s, it was being developed at the same time as Constellation was being developed and coming forward, which means to me that there was and is a certain movement of consciousness in the world that wants to be expressed in this way. And part of the original fascination and surprise was the phenomenon that, yes, you could walk something for yourself, but more importantly, or at least as important, was I could walk for someone else. Yes. And that lifts it to a whole other level of implication. Connect yeah. to anyone yeah. or anything just through intention and being connected to our bodies. That's a game-changing paradigm, which, of course, we know. There's a huge history of that for as long as humans have been around with shamanistic practice or what have you. But in what I would term a modern, non-religious context, that is now being offered as, oh, yes, you can do that. You can access states of consciousness of other beings, at least through your own experience, through you walking as that thing. That has profound implications. And what we found originally is it had profound benefits. And that was the point. It wasn't that Joseph could just walk his own pain or healing. It was that he could walk Ali's, that he could walk John's, that John could walk Joseph, that John could walk Joseph's mother who was deceased. And things that you have no way of knowing in any direct way that that was possible for the walker as well. And that whatever that resonance is, this phenomenon holds. John Cogswell, my mentor and co-founder of the technique, was a practicing Buddhist. And he said, well, of course, we can walk as each other because essentially we are each other. He went to that mystic level of saying, if we are one on some level, then of course it's possible. It's a matter of the ego simply loosening up a bit and just going and just reflecting whatever needs to be reflected. And I resonate with that notion quite a bit. But other yeah. people talk about a field and that we have access to a field. There's many ways to conceive. But the fact is, it is a phenomenon. In Constellation, they're called representatives, that there's a representative perception. And you have a lot to say about that, I'm sure. But walking in your shoes, we just simply say you're a walker and you have an intention to be the other, and let's just unfold that experience here. Yeah. And we leave it at that. We leave it at that level. I think, though, that it's helpful to bring in terms like mirror neurons. You use the term somatic empathy a lot. I believe this capacity is coming more to the fore in a variety of ways because the body is starting to be reclaimed all across the world in a variety of ways. Mm. And it has been for centuries disenfranchised, dissociated from on a global, cultural, multicultural level. 
so that without the body, we can't connect with ourselves and others in the way that we now know that we can. So I do think just bringing back the body as an integral part, obviously, it's not just an integral part, it's a necessary part of our existence, rather than distance ourselves from it and judge it or mechanize it or um, consider it to be just this big, bad liability that's going to lead us astray and into sin Mm. or break down and not Um, behave properly, but that it actually has these capacities that could seem almost magical or mystical when really, I'm going to use the word again, they really are the birthright of what it is to be a body. Many indigenous cultures never lost this capacity, but we industrialized people are claiming it back. And thanks to walking in shoes, you're helping make that a lot easier. So I want to thank you for that, for bringing it to the world, Joseph. It's a great gift. It is such a great pleasure. That is the potential of this as many methods out there but the potential of this one in my view is we combine so many of the best things we know that finally reclaim a birthright that is so well said a essence of being human that is yours i love what you say it's like a reclaiming and a deep reconsideration of the body Yeah, we've got centuries of religious misunderstanding, I think, and control issues and all of the cultural things. We know that the body was actually outlawed on some level and therefore dissociated, certainly in how industrialization took over. That's a whole other discussion. But (laughs) what's happening in many, every culture, this has all come up now that we all are on a process of reclaiming body for what it is, what it can be, what it naturally is. And boy, that's exciting to think that. And walking is certainly an evolutionary growth out of that impulse to become more conscious. Hello, Brilliant Bodies. Just a short interruption to share some exciting news from our first guest, integral anatomist Gil Headley, featured in the episode, The Body is a Gift, A Reverential Journey into the Human Body. Gil has now embarked on a one of a kind tour of the US and beyond to share his gobsmacking presentation, The Nerve Project, exploring the nerve tree in relationship. Having personally attended, I gotta tell you, this experience will rock your world and expand your appreciation of how brilliantly designed our bodies, specifically our nerve tree really is. Simply put, nothing has been done quite like this before, and Gil is very excited to share this groundbreaking work with you. To find more information and tickets, go to his website at www.gilhedley.com slash the nerve tour. All information is on the show notes below. So don't miss out. Reserve your tickets now. Your body being will thank you for it. With all the problems of human civilization, at the same time, maybe because of the problems too, there is an impulse to become more and more aware of our potential, of what we are, what we can be. And that has to do with removing a lot of things that are in the way. Yeah, a lot of armoring, both psychically as well as physically, emotionally, between each other especially with ourselves. If walking were to add something to the growth of the world, it would be the growth of a single human being, each of us. We we were lucky, the two of us, to even be in a time where we could have access to that idea. I could walk. I could have an intention. I can be in empathy with it. I can notice how my body gives me information. That information I'm walking for someone else has a benefit. It helps them see something or grow in some way. We're working together. It's phenomenal. We would have been burned at the stake for sure. It's audacious. Yeah. It's even audacious still within the context of our everyday world that we see out there. And I'll say that out of a great ego or something. It's just, it is fantastic that it's happening and that we have the possibility. There are other things to do. <laughs> I just don't know anything that's more exciting at the moment. 
than doing this work. As soon as I had the early epiphany in my early 20s when this kind of hit me, and then it became a lifelong sort of quest. Some things come and they go and they pass away, and this one never has. It grows. So how did it feed your growth as an actor? And how did your experience as an actor expand your capacity to walk? There's some marriage there that is hard to completely put words to, but certainly when I was first working with Dr. Cogswell, it was all about art to me. It was all about creativity. It was all about acting. I was a young actor. I wanted to be a good actor. I was interested in what my capability could be. And he was mentoring me in a certain way, though he was no acting teacher. He was a, a transpersonal psychologist, essentially. And the ex experiments we started playing in this way it was perfect for me. Because as an actor, as a creative, it was about use your body, use your emotions, use your awareness of perspective or where you're coming from. And to step into the shoes of another, which is how we got the phrase walking in your shoes, was natural. That was the whole point of being an actor. I'm a privileged white kid from Southern California, essentially, but I want to walk in the shoes of a hardened criminal or whatever. <laughs> and how is that even possible? And John was saying, maybe it's possible just by allowing yourself to access that level of experience as a human, that it's there that you could do that. And I was like, no, you have to think about it and, and read and study and observe people. Isn't it in acting, not just in acting, but in many art forms, this notion that we have all of us within us and acting is all about accessing that particular part of the dial. But John and what you developed came along and we're like, yeah, but this is an actual, as you say, model to access that particular spot on the dial of human experience. Yeah, exactly. And what's a way to do that isn't just thinking about it or talking yeah. about it. It's a way to actually do it. And he immediately saw the implications for just human awareness, what it could do on a psychological, even spiritual level because of the fact of our being had this possibility. And so he was very interested in it purely for those reasons. But I was the actor. I was this young guy who jump in. I jump into the process. I'm trained to do that on a certain level. It's like an improvisation, but this was not an improvisation. This was an experiencing. It's quite different. That's different. where we, I think you add the level of mindfulness. You add the level of inquiry. As an actor, the gift of improvisation is to tap into your creative instincts, but to create something usually for the benefit of performance or the benefit of an audience or the benefit of comedy, even. Most people think of improvisation as comedy. This was quite different. This was the experience for the experience sake, but also for your consciousness sake if you will, and yeah, how and I inform you. I still saw that as absolutely creative and wonderful, that there was this transformational possibility. Within minutes, I felt I was in the body of the character or the role. I was having impulses. I was seeing things differently. And it was tangible to me. It wasn't just pretending. So that really turned me on and it very quickly got me saying, my actor friends, hey, we have to do this. We have to try this. You got to try this. And then slowly that evolved into a theater company, which lasted basically for 25 years. And that's yeah. how I really studied it. Yeah. Just wanted to add that also a lot of emphasis on acting from my years a long time ago was that the focus was on listening listening to your partner, listening to your co-actors. And this is all about listening to your own flesh, to your own sensations, mm -hmm. your own inner details, which is also very different, don't you I think? think? It's very different than any 
traditional approach to acting that I know. In fact, it, it, it coexists or is an enhancement to the acting training that one could do. The listening, focus on your partner, all of the typical things that we do to affect good acting. This is something else. It exists at a level of depth work, if you will. So I would recommend to actors, let's walk the aspect of this character that is his fear. Let's mm -hmm. walk the access to the part of this character that is his persona, how he presents to the world. And it's still calling upon deep creative intuition in the actor or the walker. And this happens in every walk, by the way, whether you're an actor or a person in the world. And so it all became cross-pollinated. It's still tapping upon your deep creative instincts and resources but I dare say in a way that's much more direct, simple, immediate. It's one way of exploring many aspects of a story, a character, whatever it is I'm working on. But it increased my awareness of my body mind, of my sensory apparatus, of my mm -hmm. possibilities. And I could do things as an actor, especially now that I would have never permitted myself to do before getting deeper into walking. I wish I could articulate it. I think it's an experience of yourself that is beyond the experience of yourself that you normally might have. We all have a certain amount of self-construct or concept. Ali is this person, Joseph is that person. But I did things in walks that I felt like I had never done in my body. Call that jumping around like an idiot even, or thinking I could fly around the room or becoming completely withdrawn into myself as if I was an embryo. It's really offering you a range of experiences that can only serve you as an actor. And ultimately that became my leap as a human. If you could use this method to actualize all of your dimensionality, your parts of self, I mean, it's such a joy to watch someone do a walk and maybe they end up rolling around on the floor and kicking their legs at the sky and they jump up and say, I've never done that before. I have never done that before. And how do you feel? I feel like I just did something that is incredible. And that's very exciting. Yeah. Is it permission to go further into who you are? Maybe. I wanted to that. come back around to you're talking about the variation in people's capacity to express themselves physically and to unfold a walk and to start with the clarification that walking isn't just walking as you just gave examples a walk may begin in the propulsion of putting one foot in front of the other but as you follow your body and its impulses you can start to express yourself physically in any and all ways the walking is just a way to begin. So I really wanted to clarify that if people are thinking, wait a minute, are you just walking around the room and all of a sudden you get all this bodily information? Yeah. It's this beautiful way of following what your body is feeling to do. And with that fluent mm. listening on a mm. sensory, physical, sometimes mobile, sometimes immobilized way, you are able to continue to unfold the sensory, emotional, and sometimes deeply uh, psychological information that Absolutely. comes. Absolutely, yeah. It's important to clarify that when we say walking. Walking is taking on a new, for us, who use the method, we could say we redefine walking, which we do every day, most of us, from one point to another. And then there is a walk, which I would like to capitalize it if I could redefine it in the dictionary. My dream is that one day it will have capital letter <laughs> and it'll be a proper noun. And people say, oh, a walk, that's a different thing. That's a consciously engaged movement process <laughs> that is to access deep information. That could be a definition. And that's quite different. So when we walk and we do start, often start, I should say, with the locomotion of the body, because it's a simple method of movement that brings conscious content to the surface more readily, I think, than sitting. But that's a departure point. 
a walk as most people would experience one might be just walking and moving around the room and reporting what happens to you in this intention but it's a departure point it may go into deep expressions of the body deep expressions as you say of emotion of intention of physical gesture that have a great potential to maximize your understanding and fulfillment even of what wants to be shown through you and so we as facilitators bringing that piece back in we're there to support encourage the free flow of impulse i love how you say that the free flow of impulse because it does i don't know if you would say require mm. but it is greatly enhanced the more uninhibited one's body is which comes back to body armoring comes to trauma, it comes to dissociation, that the more unresolved trauma and inhibition there is, the less available one's body might be to express those impulses that want to come through. So I wanted to come back to that as well. We talked about the variation of expression that happens if people are either just not familiar with it and it's new to them that could be a very different thing than working with somebody whose body is an instrument that they're super familiar with to mm. release mm. and mm. allow to express mm. whatever comes up, even if it could seem in other contexts, embarrassing or odd or yeah. ridiculous. Or, or yeah, you know. illogical. A walking process is below a logic. It's not rational in any sense. It's tapping into free flow of impulse, which basically means something that's terribly organic. It's not linear in any special way. It's emanations of impulse. And so that means the body is likely to be at least wanting to show itself or connect with itself through movement that is not ordinary what you allow yourself. And so walks have this great potential to be an education, I think, of body and emotional intelligence. Those are two fancy words that everyone uses now. I often wonder what they mean because I see it in walks all the time. An increased sense of what you really are feeling on an emotional level. Most people, including ourselves, dissociate from our emotions. What am I even feeling in this moment? Oh, I feel okay. Okay is not an emotion. It's, <laughs> there's a disguise and the walking has a way of pulling those masks away and allowing you to have permission to feel exactly what you feel and your facilitator is there to support it. And so too with the physical expressions, again, the body has so much information about whatever the subject may be and your relationship to it. Maybe we touch on that now. We, we're all coming from certain limitations that could be based in trauma in our childhood or experiences we may have had. So our body has an instinct to cope and therefore armor itself. But we also come from environments or society that limit our range of expression, what we're allowed to express safely. And so we're coming from at least those two conditions. And it can limit our ability to express ourselves, ergo, our ability to even know ourselves. Because I put expression and knowing very closely together. And ultimately. also body intelligence and emotional intelligence. If you can't feel your body, you're probably less likely to feel a lot of emotion. I don't mm. know if that's true universally, but. I think it's I think fair it's to say good, it's fair to say a good bet that the less you can feel your body, it's harder to get to really experience your emotion. And there's a lot of things out there in our various cultures that want to condition us to do exactly that, to not express. In fact, even in certain societies, religions, or, or cultures, it's bad to express. So what walking does is counter to all that. It is a counter veiling paradigm that says, nope, it's actually the opposite. It's good to express. The walk is allowing you to do that. And if you stick with it as a practice, I've seen it many times over the years, including in myself, you will grow with that capacity. 
you just will. If you keep doing walks, you will grow in terms of your lack of inhibition, your ability to directly express, even be radically honest about who you are and what you're feeling. And, and your sense of connectedness to others in the world. Yeah. It's not just about walking and jumping around and shouting. Ultimately, there's a whole other dimension, which in the walk, your facilitator will often say, are you meeting the world at this moment? How are you connecting with others or not? What's your relationship to the greater sphere? And boy, there's a lot of potential to unfold there. And our ability to connect and our desire to be seen and be connected with others. I think it is also part of our instinctive birthright to say fact of our being. We, yeah, we could be sheep or we could be lions, whatever we are. We're in this group, no matter what you do, you're in relationship to the group, whether you isolate, whether you go to it, whether you're in the middle, we're in a group and there's great possibilities with that group. So walking has always made that a part of its appeal. We often work in groups. The power of a group holding process is profound. Each person is part of that unfolding in some way. So yeah, walking in your shoes is a gateway for great connection. There's also this phenomenon of body armoring. And I think we should definitely go more into that because there's a reason why people, besides cultural reasons, armor up just to survive oftentimes, or probably in most human cases, we need to armor up in order to deal with the group, whether family, school, at work. So I think it's very important to also talk about armoring, the importance of armoring, and the hope of de-armoring in part through the walking in your shoes process. Certainly the fact of our armoring, our way of protecting oneself grows out of various experiences that if they're not purely cultural, they are about the nervous system being overwhelmed. We know this from all the wonderful new thinking about trauma and that armoring or coping is a strategy towards survival and can serve us very well and at the same time not serve us so well because the very basis of armoring is I may be protected, whether it's through my muscular tension, how I regard my body, or I think armoring goes into the realm of even what I allow myself emotionally to feel or express, and I would even reach it further into what I believe. What I choose to believe can be an armoring, whether it's racial or sexual or whatever, you know, gets into that realm too. Yeah. And we order our behavior based on so-called beliefs. It may be the other way around too. I'm not sure. So all of that has served us to survive and all the best thinking on trauma work today says that. It says, look, you managed to survive by doing strange rituals that make you feel safe or holding your body in this strong, erect way, or withdrawing into yourself. And one could say that's all forms of armor or protection. What we found, and I started looking at it, I don't know if it was right at the beginning, but early on in the walking method was noticing how resistance shows up in a walk. So it was natural resistance, and it could come in the form of the body, where there was perhaps a resistance against vulnerability, which is something we also might want to talk about how vulnerable I am. I'm my openness to how much I feel. Vulnerability certainly has to do with our openness to feeling and perhaps being touched at a deep level. And therefore my fear, which is the fear of being hurt, overwhelmed, destroyed, even dying, we get to those levels. There is a natural resistance to that much vulnerability. And yet what the trauma therapists who have studied a long time on it, certainly all the walks that I experienced 
showed that there was also the possibility of resilience that through exposure and willingness to expose oneself to those areas of vulnerability created great acceptance of self and therefore resilience too. And resilience is the only way through. There is no way around most of life. There is only through and to go through the incredible pains of living or experience, resilience will be needed just the way animals have much more direct access to their resilience. They can shake it off much more quickly. So in the walks, I just started to see that. And I thought, oh, here's an opportunity to work with resistance or armoring purely as information and mm -hmm. as a potential for knowing much more about either the character, the person I'm walking, the theme, whatever it is I'm walking, I can know much more. If there's a resistance, for instance, I want to hold my fists. Why am I holding my fists so strongly? And the facilitator would work with you and say, well, what's happening there? Can you give that a voice? Or is there a movement that those fists want to do? And is there a feeling that comes up from it? So there's so much potential in my armoring. This is my armor or the band of tension across my chest or the feeling I have to cover myself, or I want to go up into a ball. We don't say we got to get the person out of that. In fact, what we want to do is honor that armor and say, what does it have to say? What does it want to do? Why is that showing up in this theme? How is it connected to the theme of this walk? And if you let that walker and support that walker in having that experience, something remarkable will happen almost always. It will fulfill itself. It will fulfill what it needed to fulfill. And almost as if, and I hate to use the word by magic, it's not magic, it's a natural process, an organic impulse. It will allow itself to release. You will see natural release of armor into a softening, into another possibility, but it comes through the agency of that walker and through their deep listening, as you said, to what is okay for them. And so the potential is when I do the walking in your shoes trauma work is allowing the body, mind, nervous system to have that completion consciously around the armor that is needed. And it can be in one walk, it can be over several walks where that person who has needed that armor has the opportunity to remove it slowly, sometimes very vigorously, sometimes with deep emotion and consciousness and awareness of what it's like that it could be safe to live without that armor. So this is a wonderful part, I would say, of the essential process and essential method is that we allow and honor and help that walker or person discharge whatever is needed about their armor. And we build this on the legacy of people like Wilhelm Reich and Alexander Lowen, who talked about bioenergetics. And if you move that part of the body, you will release something. Yeah, I was writing pages released. on them in college. Yep. I remember you telling <laughs> me that. And we are absolutely building on that legacy of study by doing these walks where this is always present. It's an ingredient. John Cogswell said, he told me initially, keep doing that movement because he knew Al Lowen and knew his work quite well. He says, if you keep doing it, something is likely to become conscious because the body is holding intelligence and awareness, but usually at a subconscious level through its holding of the musculature and yeah. energy. You know, yeah, we, I was we, gonna we, say, most of us just sitting around, not experiencing our bodies in that more detailed way, don't tend to necessarily even know what it is that's really bothering us or how we're armored or what the armor is there for, because it might have started 23 years ago. And yet when you put this in motion, and as you say, give it a, a voice and a movement, all that old material and memory that's been suppressed can be revealed. And I also wanted to add, Joseph, that 
The gift and efficacy of mirror neurons also work so beautifully in walking in your shoes because somebody else can walk your trauma. Somebody else can walk your armor and discharge some of that armor for the person whose walk it is. So I'd love for you to speak more about that too, if you have a particular example of that, where the person themselves might have been too traumatized to do that walk themselves or a part of that walk and somebody else did it for them and was able to help them release it. This is truly one of the, to me, just the most beautiful gifts of the walking process that we do walks for others on whatever, whatever level and whatever subject they want. And particularly, let's go right to it since we're talking about body armoring and association with trauma, dissociated state coming into association again or integration. This is possible. Certainly the mirror neuron component must, one day we're going to get a study and we're going to get to somehow map what is happening with the mirror neurons. Yes. And by the way, not unlike theater in a certain sense, which is where yes. I originally come from. There's a kind of circle of, of empathy going on in that theater and there ergo in a walk where the client person who has asked for the walk says, would you please do this walk for me as the extension of me as my proxy, if you will. And I do liken that a little bit too, as if the audience said, they have a pain, would the actor please now act that for me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I have a problem, or I have a psychic disturbance. Which is why we go to the movies, of course. Which is I why mean, we go to the movies, why we go to the theater. It was, yes. to me, back to the original shamans in a cave doing stories. <laughs> it was all for the benefit of the whole integration of the group. So let's take an example, though. How would this work? Because I think the trauma specialists, we have something to offer them. They don't necessarily go to this level yet. I want to say it's not acceptable yet. Now, in body psychotherapy, we're including the body, which is terrific, but we weren't doing that 30 years ago either. So things are getting modified as we go. But already what we do with walking is say, sure, this trauma, you're just opening this up today with us. For you to directly get up and say, I'm not going to walk the trauma of, God forbid, when I was raped or if I was abused or when I nearly drowned. Because today I still go into a elevator and I feel claustrophobic and I have PTSD. And how am I going to work with that? And am I going to get up and just walk that myself? That's really scary to say, I'm all on my own out here. I don't care if there's a group and a facilitator. We need to approach this in a safe way. And the somatic experiencing have their ways of doing that but we take it one step further and say, someone can walk that for you. And that is okay. And this is a way for you with your trauma to begin the process of renegotiation and begin gently, if you will, to open this up. Gently meaning you might I, not actually walk the incident itself or your experience of the incident. You might walk just an aspect of it, or even the resolution of your own healing process or something. I just wanted to add that too, in case people think, oh my God, you would make me walk when I was raped. I just wanted yeah. to clarify well, that. One of the parts which takes a little more time to get into is there's a pre-walk process where the facilitator is working with a client. And in that pre-walk, it's all about inviting them to be authentic, but also to feel very safe in engaging, touching on this. Not to mention the fact that there are times many traumas are not even known. Yes. And we actually don't even have to know. Because when you come back to the mirror neuron effect, there is something there that we don't even need to have a lot of information about this. And the facilitator will work with you and you'll come up with a walk together, a frame, we would say, a frame mm -hmm. walk which will be the empathic intention. And it's always phrased as I am now this subject. And so it can be phrased as I am now the trauma. I am now my relationship to that event. I am now, certainly we can use the word healing or recovery from this. And of course, most people are like, yeah, that's what I want. 
I would like to just visit that memory. No, I would like my recovery. I'd like to see what that looks like, what is needed. And that can be a walk. So already you're inviting a client to be in that state of choice. As we say in the trauma work, the whole point is that choice was often taken away. Yes. Now you have choice. You can choose how to work on this. You can choose what is right for you. You have that agency. And so already you're working on that level. I did a walk recently for a person that had a, a near drowning accident when they were five years old, really young. And they're convinced that it's still with them. They said, I still have problems. I get triggered, claustrophobia, elevators, small spaces. There are moments you know, like I have a PTSD reaction and I get anxious, anxiety attack and so forth. Would you like to walk this? No, but I would like you to walk it. <laughs> okay. So I, I did a walk for this person and a lot of things happened for me in my, let's say, co-resonance with this person. If we look at it that way. I'm just open to whatever's going to happen in my body experience and in my perception. And I had a sense of being in a box and I had a sense of falling and I had a sense of darkness and I had a lot of impressions. And at first I was quite dissociated from it in my walk, which is very interesting. Even though I was going into the a dissociated state, the client was having, I would say, immediate sensations. When the walker walks for you, it's as if they say, let me take that from you yes, and let me move it. So you're not talk about armoring. In a way, I was saying to the client, give me this. You yes. don't have to armor that for the next 10 minutes. You don't have to armor anything. And I'm moving around and their body in this case, in this walk, immediately started to discharge emotionally. Certainly there's tears, there was sadness, certain grief for that experience. And she let her body open up, the legs came out. There was even a uh, discharging, I will say from the belly, air coming up, belching. And she just had to allow it. And she did. And I said, just allow that to happen. It's your body just saying, I'm letting some of this armoring out, air coming up, trying to get out. And she was just sitting in her chair while I was walking and moving with this. And ultimately I started connecting with the feelings in my hands and my arms that wanted to push very hard against all this darkness and this dissociated inertia. I was going through stages of what well, was like a paralysis or a kind of freeze going on. But now there's a resource coming up because I'm allowing the freeze to be there, by the way. I'm not saying get out of the freeze. I don't do that. Be frozen. How is it to be frozen? Can you be more frozen even? How do you see the world from the frozen point of view? And ultimately something starts to arrive that again, I think is purely natural. Maybe it's the principle of survival, what have you, that says, no, there's something I've got to do here. There's something I've got to access. And then I was just fully engaged energetically with a lot of movement. And it just, I said, I have so much power at this moment. It's unbelievable how much power I have. Two minutes before, I couldn't feel a thing. And all of a sudden, my body's had an experience of profound power. Like this is the power where they say mothers lift up a car to get their kid out. It was like, I could do it. I know I could do it. And I could do it is integrating in the consciousness too. I can do this. I have the power to do this. My client there was absolutely letting her body shake, letting her body discharge things, letting emotion be there, getting her breath back. And I even had an experience of the others where I went to people and felt I can be present with you now. Finally, there was a kind of evening off or leveling off in the walk. And I was able to say, I think this is enough. Ultimately, trauma is all about coming back into your present state. But that's the work that all trauma therapists want to do is, can you stay here in the body with us, with me, 
in this moment. And all I can say is that then the post walk process with the client, she said, I feel profoundly relaxed in a way that I haven't felt in a long time. I relate to not only what you were going through. And again, she didn't describe the event to me either, but I just feel this connection with people in the room in the moment. And that's something I also want. So there were many benefits that happened from this. And I can't say exactly what is happening on the neurobiologic level, but what I do know is that she is able to relate to what the walker is doing, this person, through this lens of her trauma. And she's even allowing herself and the body-mind to recognize and feel safe enough to discharge things. And ultimately, healing trauma is about completions and discharging of locked-up energy in a conscious way. And the walk certainly allowed her to go there. In a very short space of time, I want to add, this doesn't take three hours to do. I even often time walks and go, we're going to do this for 10 minutes. Because I want you to know, we're not just going to do this for your trauma for the next 90 minutes or so. <laughs> it makes it safe. Safety is so important. And also just the healing capacity for somebody else, as you say, to take to be willing to feel that distress, that pain, that terror for somebody is so healing in itself. It's so generous that we are willing to go to a group and say, yes, I will take this. I will feel this for you. And I will move it through in a way that you haven't yet been able to. I just love that about walking in your shoes and about family constellation work. It's the main reason I fell in love with both is how we can do this for each other, be present for each other. There's all kinds of beautiful ways that people show up for each other, but I particularly there love are, it. But I love it for those reasons too. It is active. It is participatory. It is communal at times. And there is something happening there that really feels right about our human potential to heal, to be there for each other, to be a resource for the whole. And I wanted to add one thing for the walking. I always say, look at the double benefit. It's not only that you're there as a noble walker walking this yes. thing. You're having an experience of self that frankly is connecting you to deep parts of you and parts that are beyond what you even think you're capable of. If I walk the loving relationship of this couple and I get to experience that in some way. How does that not benefit me in my capacity? I'm feeling those things. I'm allowing my body mind to go there. So there's this marvelous thing of I am walking in service and I'm walking in an expansion of myself that ultimately brings me great benefit too. I so, love that. Then you can get into the collective unconsciousness. Some people say the field is that and that we're tapping into what is always there. I want to say too, because you gave a really positive example of, wow, that's what it would feel like to be happy in a marriage. But there's also that trauma work, walking this drowning experience, even though you personally may not have ever almost drowned, most likely it's analogous to some kind of trauma or constraint or terror that you probably have experienced at some point in your life. And that will help work it through for you by walking her experience. For sure. Whatever is analogous there, my body mind is certainly resourcing and accessing that and working with that. So surely I am expanding my capacity for resilience to its many possibilities. And I don't know too many other ways to do it. But walking seems to put together all these potentialities. And I'm just happy to do it and offer it and train others to do it. And hopefully they will train others too. And maybe through ourselves, there is some shift going on that will benefit everyone else. You know? Indeed. And before we let people know how to find you, I just have two more questions for you. So how do you define embodiment? I don't know. 
<laughs> too much has been, been said. defining it for the last hour and a half. So I, if I haven't defined it for the last hour and a half, it, it hasn't been defined. It may be undefinable. It is the full engagement of the body, mind, in the felt sense, through movement, through recognition of that which you know, wish to know, through the expression of your body. Beautiful. And lastly, what do you like best about being your body, being a body and your body? What do I like best about it? My capacity for pleasure. <laughs> intense pleasure and i would say the resource that it has this capacity to know things through all of what was said i can know through my body the thing i'm really into right now which i do not only in walks but in my yoga practice is simply saying and this i accept mm. so i accept my trembling my quaking mess of a body I accept my pleasure in this moment. I accept that pain I'm feeling in, in my hip. I accept all of it. And it's a great game of acceptance and freedom in a way. I accept my resistance. I accept my letting go. So that's my favorite thing I'm doing now. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So if people want to experience a walk, experience Joseph Culp, as a facilitator or the other beautiful creative things he's doing, or actually even become a facilitator of walking in your shoes, you can find all that information and so much more at www.josephculp, that's C-U-L-P.com. And I just want to thank you again, Joseph, for being with me on this journey of embodiment and living to tell the tale. It is. Such a great pleasure to know you, to be with you on this journey, and I am happy to be here with you and discussing this and that we share this passion for this method. And all of what you said, we will not come to our healing or integration or our enlightenment except through the body. Mm. We will yeah. only come to it that way. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more. It's a great gift. Thanks so much for sticking around till the end. If you enjoyed this episode, please give that like button a little click. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell. I've got a bunch of fascinating guests lined up with trailblazing experts in the field that I'm really excited to share with you. I'm eager to hear from you too, so don't be shy. Drop a comment below. Share your thoughts, suggestions, or just say hi. Your insights on this episode mean the world to me. So go ahead, spread some love, like, subscribe, and share your thoughts below. Your support keeps this channel going strong, and I'm genuinely grateful for each and every one of you. Till next time, stay brilliant. I hope you found this episode inspiring. If you'd like to learn more about the many ways I'm encouraging and guiding the wider world to reclaim the brilliance of the body, please visit my website at www.alimezey.com. Thanks so much for listening. Until the next episode and beyond, reclaim your brilliant body. The Brilliant Body Podcast was created by Ali Maze. This episode was co-produced and edited by Ali Maze and Florence Popoff. Thanks to Rachel Fell and Nina Demore for additional editing, to Florence Popoff also for my social media management, and to composer Blair, Mr. One Man Ben Wilson for my theme music.